Last time, we jumped back in the Star Wars chronology with, to the events right after Return of the Jedi. This time, we are moving forward to after the events of Dark Empire with the first part of the Jedi Academy trilogy, Jedi Search. Unlike with the Thrawn trilogy, I'm not going to be doing these three books all in one whack, because there are other books that come out in between them, as opposed to the Thrawn trilogy. And the Jedi Academy trilogy books build off of them, to varying degrees. What is probably most notable about Jedi Search is that this is the point where the Star Wars expanded universe really starts to become cohesive. Previous works had built off each other mainly through common elements, such as the West End Games RPG source books that had been used for as reference for planets and mechanical nomenclature and that sort of thing. But outside of a short call-out in Dark Empire, we hadn't really gotten that much direct reference to the other novels or comics released to date. Kevin J. Anderson really starts to change that. This book picks up not much after the events of Dark Empire, and over the course of the opening of the book, Coruscant is still undergoing rebuilding from the Emperor Reborn's attack. The Sizruk, or Sizruk, are brought up, over the course of the story in a couple points, and the conclusion of the book references the Witches of Dathomer, who come up in the next novel we'll be covering, The Courtship of Princess Leia, which wasn't out yet when this book was published. I cannot get any research on whether Anderson took the initiative to find out about upcoming titles with Lucasfilm, or if he instead started getting in touch with the other authors. From what I can tell, this is before the position of the Keeper of the Holocron was established as someone who is responsible for coordinating the different aspects of the Star Wars Expanded uni Universe, from authors to comics publishers and that sort of thing. So, this would have had to have been something that the writers who are working on these books got together on on their own, or had some sort of basic coordination being done by Lucasfilm. In any case, this does, however, lead to Anderson getting involved with the Tales of the Jedi series as well, which in turn leads to him shaping the history of the Star Wars universe dramatically. In the wake of the Emperor Reborn's failed attempt to conquer Coruscant and the galaxy, the New Republic is in the mix of repairing the damage and attempting to rebuild the city. During this, Luke Skywalker comes forward to the Republic Council with a request for approval to start a new Jedi Academy. The Council votes for approval, and Leia is tasked with finding a world for them to set up shop. Around this time, a construction droid discovers a hidden Imperial facility that contains portable sensors that can be used to measure a person's force sensitivity. Luke also discovers a way, just using the Force, to tell if a person is Force-sensitive. By probing a specific portion of a person's mind, he can tell if a person being probed has the ability to use the Force. After some research by R2-D2 puts together a list of possible candidates for Jedi training, Luke and Lando split up to go find possible future Jedi. Meanwhile, 
Hansel and Chewbacca are traveling to Kessel on a diplomatic mission in the hopes of opening relations with the prison planet on Leia's request. On arrival, he finds himself shot down and captured by Morif Duel, a former inmate who had now taken over the planet. It turns out that Duel was responsible for betraying Solo to the Empire and leading him to dump the shipment of spice that put him on Jabba's bad side before the events of A New Hope. Duel sends Solo into the depths of the mines and plans to cover up their disappearance. Luke successfully finds two candidates. The first is Gantorus, from the failed colony world of Ail Sha. His force sensitivity allowed him to keep the people of his world alive in the face of the hazards of living on their unstable world. The second was Strain, a gas miner in Herman and Bespin, whose telepathic sensitivity had led him to lead a life of isolation. Lando was less successful, only spotting a cheater in the blob races on the planet Ungol. On returning to Coruscant, Luke and Lando learn about Han being overdue, and set out to Kessel themselves to investigate. Meanwhile, Han and Chewie work to engineer their escape, with the help of a young inmate who shows a degree of precognition, named Kip Duran. During their escape, they learn that Vima Da Boda, from Dark Empire, had spent some time on Kessel, and had provided Duran some tutelage in the ways of the Force. When Han and company's escape leads them into the clutches of the Maw, a cluster of black holes near Kessel, they discover an Imperial outpost lurking in the core of it, the research outpost where the Death Star and its super laser was researched and designed. The outpost, commanded by Admiral Dalla, the only woman to reach flag rank in the Imperial Navy, has been incommunicado since before the Battle of Endor, and its existence has apparently, was apparently known only to Grand Moff Tarkin himself. Further, they learned that the outpost was not only responsible for the design of the Death Star and its super laser, but also the world devastators from Dark Empire, and they have a new weapon that has approached completion. The Sun Crusher a ship that's impervious to any weapon and can cause stars to go supernova. Back on Coruscant, Leia ends up organizing and hosting a visit of the Imperial Governor of Caridia, the world that plays host to the Imperial Academy. Caridia's governor rebuffs the New Republic as rebels and even goes so far as to throw a drink into Mon Mothma's face. On Kessel, Lando and Luke arrive, posing as investors and take a tour of the facility. Finding the Falcon among the outpost's feet, and discovering that Han and Chewie are absent, the two steal it back. Meanwhile, at the Maw, Han is persuaded one of the alien scientists at the facility, Kui Zux, that the technology she has been designing for is actually weapons of mass destruction. She agrees to spring Han, Chewie, and Kip, and the four of them steal the Sun Crusher and escape. Han and company manage to emerge from the Maw and almost run into Luke and Lando and the Falcon in the process, and the two groups return to Coruscant, while Duel's fleet, which is pursuing Luke and Lando, and Dalla's fleet, which are pursuing Han and company, end up slugging it out. Returning to Coruscant, they learn that Leia has selected a world for Luke's Jedi Academy, Yavin 4, the outpost from where the attack that destroyed the Death Star was launched. It's quiet, and it's out of the way. What could possibly go wrong? The Witches of Dothomir are mentioned here for the first time. They will have a proper appearance in the courtship of Princess Leia, which is published a few months later. We learn that there are different kinds of spice. There's Glitter Stem, which must be mined in total darkness, and like the spice from Dune, can augment or instill psychic abilities whoever takes it, and Real Spice, which can be found on more worlds and which we learn later is used in the production of Bacta. We have our first actual visit to Kessel. Previously, it had only been mentioned in passing by C-3PO in A New Hope. c Vuk territory is still unmapped, and the Republic has had no further dealings with them, peaceful or otherwise. The Imperial Academy, which was previously only mentioned in passing in A New Hope as where Luke was planning to go, now has a homeworld, Caridia. We learn where the Death Star was designed, the Ma installation, with the project sponsored by Grand Moff Tarkin. This would be heavily retconned in the new expanded universe as we see in Rogue One. Bevel Leminensk 
and I probably mispronounced that, is first mentioned as the lead designer of the Death Star. Luke Skywalker is moving forward with his plan to build the Jedi Academy. He is somewhat apprehensive due to what happened with Obi-Wan and Anakin, but he knows this needs to be done. Leia has not had regular content with, contact with her kids for two years as they've been raised off Coruscant, and now she gets to live with them for the first time in the long term. This is in turn rather negatively affecting her diplomatic patience. Han used to have a business relationship with Morith Duel, which ended when Duel betrayed Solo over the spice shipment that led to the events of A New Hope. Gib Duran was raised in the tunnels of Kessel and has briefly gotten some training in the Force from Vima Da Boda. He is very powerful in the Force. Gantoris is the protector of the people of Eel Shaw and was very reluctant to leave. He has had a prescient dream that a dark man would offer to teach him great power, and then would destroy him. Strain is a gas miner from Bespin. His telepathic sensitivity can allow him to, unwillingly, pick up ambient thoughts from people miles away. Grand Moff Tarkin is established as the mastermind of the Death Star Project, as a means of using fear to impose the will of the Empire and quell any rebellion. He was also romantically involved with Admiral Dalla. Speaking of which, Admiral Dalla is the first woman to reach the rank of Admiral in the Imperial Navy. A significant feat is the Empire is, in addition to being xenophobic, also having some significant institutional sexism. She tricked Tarkin into recognizing her talents by posting tactical papers under a male pseudonym. Tarkin then picked her to lead the Ma installation. She has been unaware of the state of galactic politics for the past 11 years. Winter has moved to full-time nanny and caretaker for Han and Leia's twins, to the point that they think of her as their surrogate mother. Jaina and Jason Solo have moved to Coruscant again and have not seen their parents on a regular basis for several years. As mentioned in the backstory, this is the point where the EU really starts to become an actual thing, as we have a bunch of references to other novels. Because of this, I am breaking my, up my reviews of the Jedi Academy series to get into the works that were published in between. Since Kevin J. Anderson knew those books and comics were coming out when he wrote this work, and incorporated plot elements from some of those books and comics into the story he was writing, and in the case of Tales of the Jedi, vice versa. I would compare this to how Chris Claremont and Louise and Walter Simonson put together the Mutant Massacre crossover event at Marvel. It's not something that Marvel editorial pushed. It's something that just kind of came organically with the various creators communicating and working together to make this happen. Now, much later, we'll get into crossovers that are pushed by editorial mandate. But that's further down the line. The Jedi Academy trilogy gets a bad rap for several reasons, but as far as the first book is concerned, it's got some good moments. Luke and some of his other friends traveling the galaxy looking for candidates for the Academy is a really strong concept for a book. Similarly, Han and Chewie getting stuck on Kessel, having to engineer a jailbreak, and escaping with the help of a Force-sensitive prisoner who will become a recurring character in the trilogy and later books is also a really strong concept. I also like how Anderson writes the banality of evil. Morith Duel is a gangster out to make some quick bucks, and he doesn't care about who gets burned in the, com in the process. Consequently, Duel's downfall is entirely the fault of his own greed. He shoots down the Falcon because Han Solo still being alive is the loose end from a previous scheme of his. And he doesn't consider the current state of the galaxy and politics before he does this. He is, knows somewhat of what's going on, but not outside of Kessel, but he does anticipate what, would, what it would mean if he kills Han Solo, Hero of the Rebellion. When he discovers that Han Solo is there in a diplomatic capacity from the New Republic, Duel doesn't think about how Solo is married to one of the most politically powerful people in the New Republic, Princess Leia. He tries to think of ways to cover up the attack 
by shoving Solo into the mines and hoping he gets killed by the mo by a monster. That way he can claim, oh, we're just a tragic misunderstanding. When Solo escapes, he desperately tries to shoot him down because he assumes that if he kills Solo before he can get word out to the Republic, that will prevent the Republic fleet from coming down on him like the wrath of an angry god. It's just the right kind of banal, corporate evil lack of foresight. In the 90s, I remember seeing people reading that people were saying that this whole thing in the book came across as unrealistic and stupid. Because no one would be that dumb when it came to making a buck. Not to get too political, but with the current state of the economy and corporate America, and possibly also President Donald Trump, this actually makes that element of the plot feel weirdly prescient and understanding of the corporate mindset, which has led us to the situation that we're in now. Now, because of how the production calendar for Star Wars novels and comics works out, the next work I'll be covering will be the Star Wars droids comic from Dark Horse. See you, in, in, see you next month. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.